This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Good morning, good morning. Ain't it a great morning outside? A little chilly, a little overcast, at least here in central Mississippi, but we're going to be talking, we're going to bring some cheer into our gardens, into our gardens' minds, maybe even our hearts. I don't know. I'm horticulturist Felder Rushing. In the next hour, uh, you've tuned into the Gestalt Gardener. We're going to be talking about gardening, gardening in the Deep South. I know a lot of folks listen from outside the South. It's okay. We all still dig the same hole. We still stick stuff in the green side up, but from there, our paths diverge. We're going to have to look for different ways to garden according to our personalities and according to what we want out of our gardens. And more important, how do we meet our challenges? That's what we're going to be talking about, folks. For the next hour, we're going to just talk about gardening, gardening in the Deep South. Okie dokie, folks. Hope you got some things you want to talk about because otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm a retired extension horticulturist. I can talk for 45 minutes about a pencil. I could talk about a pencil for 45 minutes, and we don't want to do that, so let's come up with some things to yak about. Uh, it is uh, Halloween weekend coming up and Day of the Dead following that, and uh, if you want to talk about fall-type stuff, this is a great, great, great time to do it. I brought some stuff to talk about. You know, Jay White's here this morning. Java's still out. Java's got the—he got the—what the, what, what's the slang for what he's got now? I don't know. He's, he's got a— Man, he's under the yeah. He's under the weather, yeah. all the way under the weather. Yeah, he said uh, what, whatever we call the the, the vid, the yeah. cove, the cove thing. Yeah, but uh, anyway, we're gonna the cove thing. You made that sound almost cool. The cove thing. Yeah, well, almost. But see, as usual, I'm not cool. I've had my I, I got my vaccination. I've had four. You know, I'm an old guy. They let me go in for free and get four. I got four <laughs> of the updates, and uh, I guess I'm one of the rare individuals who never had it. Well, if, if if you've had four, if something gets through to you, Felder, you're, you're owed an explanation by somebody yeah, about something, or, or, right? Or, yeah, and I want a refund. That's right. Oh, that's right. I didn't pay for it. Um, anyway, we, I could we, work that refund anyway. I don't know. Yeah. They're not paying close enough attention. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're in. You're, you're, you're awake and all that. You're ready to rip I'm, and roll? I'm trying to. Okay. It's Friday. It is Friday, and uh, yeah. and I brought. I said a, that with a downward inflection. I said it upward. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's yeah. Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's Friday. That was totally wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I've just come, uh, Jay. I've just come off of a, a grueling lecture thing. Uh, five states. I think uh, thirteen or fourteen lectures. I've driven almost forty five hundred miles, but I have seen some. I, I've met some cool folks. I've been a lot of people last week, this past week in Louisiana, up in in. Uh, Holly Springs and Oxford. It's just been, it's been a wild ride. Wild you were, you ride. You're about as far up there as you can go without, without going down into the other yeah, states. Yeah, yeah. In, in the, the in the past two weeks, I've been from the Gulf Coast to the Tennessee line and Texas and <clears throat> Alabama. So. Just talking about gardening. That's what people want to do, and that's what we're here for this morning. I've got some some things I'd like to share, but we're here to talk about gardening with folks who call. So let's start off right off the bat, slide up, talk about North Mississippi, DeSoto County, Hernando. Good morning, Greg. How are you? All right. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I appreciate your show a lot. Look, uh, I know you're normally about how to make things thrive, but my question's the opposite. <laughs> I got crepe myrtles that were old, and they got the black stuff on them, finally kind of a fungus thing or maybe insect. But yeah. Had those things cut down, ground them down like six inches under the ground. And they're still sprouting. Filled it over with dirt. They still sprout. <laughs> and no matter what you do, they still sprout. And they sprout, you know, when when the grass is two inches tall, the sprouts are six inches tall. Yeah. Is there any way to get rid of that? Well, a, a couple of things. One is, uh, can you mow over it? Yeah, you mow over yeah, it, but, okay. you know, the sprout yeah. outgrow the grass, yeah. you know, well, five the, inches. The reason I'm getting at that, this stuff is, is sprouting up from stored carbohydrates. And sooner or later, if you just keep cutting it down, sooner or later they will peter out. They, they, you know, they're, they're not; they can't replenish them. As long as you keep cutting them down, then they're they're using up all that stored stuff that's that's in the old roots and stuff. So just mowing it will eventually get rid of it. It really, really will. Uh, otherwise, okay. you know, if you wanted to wait till next spring, let the new growth come up and get oh maybe a foot or so tall. It might be too tall for you, but let it get tall enough to where. Instead of shooting it, uh, stuff up from the ground, let it get big enough to where those leaves are starting to send stuff back down to the roots, and then spray it with Roundup. 
Yeah, ra- Roundup. Yeah. It only right. it, it only works if you put it on leaves that are sending stuff down to the roots. So it doesn't work okay. unless, unless it's that that condition. Okay. Because we have sprayed it with Roundup two or three times throughout the summer, but it, we didn't let it get up that tall. But yeah. it did have little leaves on it. But. Yeah, well, uh, again, right at first, it's sending uh, leaves and stuff up like a, a burst of energy from the ground. And it needs to get big enough mm-hmm. to, to think it's thriving, and start those leaves are starting to send stuff back down to the roots. And that means a foot, foot and a half, two feet tall. So okay. uh, I think if you just keep mowing it, that'll get rid of it. All right. Well, I appreciate it. A whole year mowing didn't, but maybe maybe the second year we it, it'll 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 peter them out. I mean, you know, they they cannot keep going without replenish. Sooner or later, they're going to use up all their energy. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate it. Good luck on it, man. I appreciate you. All right. Have a good day. Bye bye. You know, Jay, with the Halloween coming up, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. And I thought I would use this as a as, as a, an opportunity to celebrate something. I don't know if anybody's done that here in PV, but celebrate a, a guy who just went by the name the Monster. Okay. You know, a lot of people called the Monster by his creator's name, which is Frankenstein. Mm. A lot of people just don't realize Frankenstein was a doctor. His creature who who read uh, Paradise Lost. He was an intelligent creature. He had a lot of cool stuff to say, and I want to share some of that through the, while we're waiting okay. for folks to give us a call. But first, I want to uh, read a quote from Dr. Frankenstein himself, Frankenstein. Now, did you ever see Young Frankenstein? I have not. Oh, man. Come on, Jay. <laughs> that is one of Mel Brooks' <laughs> classic, yep. most quotable movies. But uh, here's I what, check that out. Here's what Dr. Victor Frankenstein said, and, and it sort of applies to me in a weird way. Uh, and it's from, from, from a gardening book. He said, The world to me is a secret which I desire to divine. Curiosity, earnest research to learn the hidden laws of nature, and a gladness akin to rapture are among the earliest sensations I can remember. There's a love of the marvelous, a belief in the marvelous, which hurries me out of the common pathway of other men. All right, so what is that visually? What do you see in your mind when you're when you're reading what he's describing there? I'm seeing a, a, a kid looking at flowers and scratching around and turning rocks over and poking around and and, and just exploring the world and you know looking at picking up turtles and yeah, you know, yeah. exploring the natural world, just trying to figure stuff out. But instead of playing soccer and baseball and football with the other guys, he's out knocking around the edge of the woods looking at dragonflies. That's it. I, yeah. I thought of. You know, scrounging around in the woods. You know, we're we're starting to get awful deep here first thing in the yeah. morning. <laughs> but in anyway, it uh, th- there's a lot of stuff going on right now in the garden. If anybody wants to do, do I, I can read quotes all day long. But I did when I was walking around the neighborhood last night. I I, I had a whiff of something that was that was nice, and there's actually. Oh man, I should have brought this in there for you to smell. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a big shrub that everybody's familiar with. Uh, a lot of people either like it or you don't, but it's a plant that gets scraggly. The word straggly. I mean, it makes my hair look good, Jay. I mean, it's a plant. <laughs> you you prune it into a big ball, and by the time you get finished, it's already sending out these long, crazy, wispy, uh, long stems. Uh, it, and it drives people nuts because it constantly puts out these long, arching branches. Uh, and it's called Eliagnus. A lot of people know it's a big plant. You can hide a school bus behind three of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally, it's a big, big plant. Uh, that's how big it gets. But a lot of people put it in their yard. And they want to keep it into a little meatball shape about three, feet, four feet tall. And immediately sends out these long, arching branches. And people say, well, i got to prune it all the time. Well, because people don't realize Eliagnus is a vine. They plant it as a shrub. So it's being miscast. Yes, yeah, it's being miscast. They, they plant it as a shrub because it's quick, it's fast, it's bold, and then all of a sudden you cannot keep it the size you want. <laughs> uh, but I've got one uh, that I planted back in the back of my garden, and I let it grow up in the trees. It grows up and hangs down. I mean, it's, it's a vine. But this time of year, it's got n- nice little sort of olive green leaves. The bottom is a silvery looking, but it's got these small flowers hidden down in the foliage that nobody sees. They don't even think about this, but it is one of the most fragrant plants of the year. Okay. It's starting to bloom now. So if you're walking around night and you smell something sweet, it's not sweet olive, uh, which is already gone. It's Eliagnus. And these little tiny white flowers with the fragrance, I mean intensely fragrant, uh, they yield to these little small, look like little banana-type fruit. 
in January, late December, January, and you can eat them. You know, you know, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you you you're not as much of a garden geek as I am. I'm not. And you're looking at me like, where's it going with this? Well, that's all there is, Jay. No, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> now you you got me thinking until you until you said you could eat it, and then that kind of threw me off the path a little bit right there. But yeah. before then, I was like, well, man, if I wanted to. Like trying to go plant those. If you put that in my mind, like what's a good time? You said it's blooming now, so yeah. when's, when's a good time to plan to anytime. add those? A- any time. Pl- any plant that's growing in a pot, you can plant any time you dig a hole. Okay. Dig a hole. But uh, anyway, a lot of people, they know Ely Agnes, they think of it as a big thing that needs to be pruned all the time. Well, if you'll stop thinking of it as a big shrub that won't stay pruned, think of it as a vine. And all of a sudden, you look a little foolish trying to keep a vine pruned into a meatball. <laughs> but also... And if you know where some Ely Agnes are, walk up to them this time of year and take a good whiff. I mean, you can smell it a block away. People just overlook the attributes of a plant that they misunderstand, which leads me back to Frankenstein. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> a little segue there. That but, was very well done. Yeah, but, you know, it's a, something we assume we know what it is, and it's a lot of trouble, kind of a monster in the yard. And if you look at it as a beautiful vine that's got real fragrant flowers and edible uh, fruits and all like that, all of a sudden, you know, it's maybe not be that lovable, but more understandable. Man, you just took us for a walk, Felder. I, I did. You hey. gave us a talking to. Well, let's, let's, let's. All you need now is to make a shirt that says intensely fragrant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, it, my shirt is one of those, say you're intensely fragrant without saying you're right. intensely fragrant. <laughs> it speaks for itself. Hey, let's go up to, to Oxford and talk with Mark. Mark, how are you this morning? Great, thank you. Good. Um, What's up? I have a question concerning Japanese boxwoods. I have several boxwoods that we planted about a year and a half ago. Um, two of them are... Half the bush is dying, and half the bush has new growth. Is this a box, um, box so, would you say? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if that would be overwatering, underwatering with half new growth and half dying. How, how long has it been out there? Uh, planted a year and a half ago. Yeah. Here's the deal with boxwoods. Boxwoods, which are real popular, they go back to colonial days. You know, they've been, they've been grown forever here. Um and also Japanese hollies like Hellerai and Hetsai. You know, a lot of people use boxwoods and Japanese hollies because they want a, a sort of a generic round bush that's a pretty green. Problem is, neither one of those have got really good roots. And uh, we've got problems with boxwoods that can, w- what happens, we have a lot of rain and, it, and, and the roots stay real wet. So the ones that are down deep rot. This is in the wintertime and the spring. So, so they end up with real shallow roots. And then it turns summertime and hot and dry and the extra stress, and all of a sudden it needs those roots, and they're not there. See, so this combination of too wet followed by too hot and dry causes root problems and causes stress, and the plants can start popping out a piece at a time. There also is a, is a boxwood blight that's coming up. It's a serious disease that's damaging a lot of historic old boxwood hedges around the south, from, from Virginia to Louisiana. So there's a, a root disease also. I can't tell them apart from the from the, the rain damage, from the disease damage, because they have the same symptom. Parts of the plant dies. So it, it would take somebody who can really examine it to tell what it is. Bottom line is, all you can do is cut out the brown stuff, maybe prune what's left, and if it fills out, great. If it doesn't, just think about replacing it because there's no real cure for either one. If you water a plant with damaged roots, it damages them further. So other than a good deep soaking about once every three or four weeks max, there's not much practical we can do to help an ailing boxwood. There's really not. Right. Uh, here, well, I appreciate your help. Well, here's one other thing. It sounds real negative, but also I worked at a wholesale nursery. We grew plants from cuttings and put them in pots and sold them. Okay, and this is something that every commercial producer does. They'll put two or three rooted cuttings in each pot because it looks fuller quicker. You know, you have a pretty little plant in a in a pot because you got two or three small ones. And let's say uh, a year later, ten year, fifteen, one of them dies. It looks like half the plants died. It's just one of them. See, so you can follow those that did stuff back down, and if it all seems to be connected to one trunk that's down there, just cut that one out and leave the other one to to fill back out. Great advice, and I appreciate your show. Wish I could give you some more advice on this, but that's about it. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Do we have a kill button in here? I got a frog in my throat. 
I can start playing music and turn your mic off. All righty. That, thank you, sir. The magic of radio. The magic of radio. Are you telling me we need to take a break? Oh, we can't. Well, we, we don't have to. Okay, if we don't I can, have hey, to. We, we give the band a, the time off if you want to. Well, let's, let's do that. We've right. got a... <laughs> Uh, hey, how about a how about a, a, another a Frankenstein quote? All right. Actually, this is from the monster him, itself. I'm not himself itself. A lot of people don't realize that Frankenstein's monster was smart. W- read Milton, you know. But here's what the monster said of himself: "Of my creation and creator, I am, was absolutely ignorant. But I knew I possessed no money, no friends, no kind of property." I was, besides, endued with a figure hideously, hideously deformed and loathsome. I was not even of the same nature as man. I was more agile than they, and I could, could subsist upon coarser diet. I bore the extremes of heat and cold less injury. My stature far exceeded theirs. When I looked around, I saw and heard none like me. Was I then a monster, a blot upon the earth from which all men fled? And whom all men disowned. That's a deep monster, man. Yeah, yeah. But look, people don't really they didn't strangle something. No, he was a he was an intelligent creature. Anyway, I don't know where all this came from. Except Halloween. It's an excuse to talk about stuff that only on MPB, only on public radio, are gonna be able to have a guarding program and quote Frankenstein's monster and make him feel pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me want to go watch it now, though. Yep. Okay, all righty, folks, let's slide down to eastern L.A., down to, to lower Alabama, to Fairhope, beautiful Fairhope, Alabama. Sam, how are you this morning? You're doing very well, and yourself? So far, so good. Keep me from quoting Frankenstein, though. What can I help you with? <laughs> well, I've got an old um, ponytail palm or an elephant foot, some people call it. Yeah. Um, I've had it for about 40 years. Mm. Uh, it's we've, we've kept it in pots and just got pots bigger and bigger for it as it grew. And now it's in a pot that's uh, roughly about three foot tall and about two foot diameter. Yeah. And it's it's gotten so big that it's just difficult to move around. Yeah. And I was wondering about the feasibility of putting in my yard. I live um, on in South Baldwin County, down on right on Mobile Bay. Yeah. And I was wondering if it could handle the uh, temperatures and the salinity that we get coming off of the bay. Well, as far as, far as the salinity, if you kept it outside, and I, I'm dubious about the the farthest north I've seen them growing outside of Central Florida, you know, and and they get pretty good size there. Um, I don't know if a frost, which we occasionally get frost, would 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 if it could could take a light frost, but you could also you know get you a you don't have to have a frame, but you could could put make you a, some some rebar and put around it and just throw some plastic over it temporarily if we have a frost. And I mean it'll take cold temperatures, but I just don't know about an actual frost. Uh, here's one thing I would do though: when I see ponytail palms, it's not really a palm by the way, it's just called that. Uh, usually I see the old big ones. You've got a, plant, a pot that's about three feet tall and two feet wide. It would do better in a pot that was three feet wide and two feet tall, low and wide. They don't need any roots at all. So you could have it where, it's, you know, if you had a wide, like a thick, a, a foot, a, a galvanized foot tub type shape. It'll grow better, okay. better than something like that, and uh, it and the the base of it gets bigger and bigger, and it doesn't need much soil at all. So you could keep it in a foot one of those foot tub type things for decades. So, uh, you know, think about it. And next time you pot it up to put it in a, a lower, wider pot. And um, if you put it out in a kind of protected place, maybe on the south side where it doesn't get any cold wind in the winter, the most you might have to do is is, uh, is throw, you know, some kind of plastic or something just during the, the cold spell itself, not during the day when it warms back up. So, you know, you could try that. But you know, uh, otherwise... Uh, if it was really valuable or really important to you, I, I wouldn't trust it just on its own. Okay. I appreciate it. That uh, that sounds like a plan. Okay, good luck. It, uh, I've got pictures of them in, in again, in uh, central Florida that, there's, you know, you couldn't possibly put your arms around the trunks of them, but, you know, they they don't get frost there. All right, good deal. I, I'll, I'll see what I can do about finding something a little different uh, to put it in and, and – We'll just leave it in the pot for now anyway. Yeah, just think low and wide. 
All right, good deal. Thank you so much. All right, appreciate it, Sam. That slide just just along the coast. Let's you know follow the 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 Highway 90 over to Biloxi. Morning, Janet. How are you? Hey, good morning. Hi, Felder. Um, yeah, I have a, a beautiful old um, Myers lemon tree in mm-hmm. my yard. And um, all the five years I've lived here, it has had those beautiful, big, round, uh, yellow lemons. And um, this year, my lemons, uh, all of a sudden, they have seeds in them. They have um, dark spots on them. And the tree is getting, like, spindly. Yeah. Like sticks. You know, one of the sticks, not so much leaves. And yeah. the leaves have that uh, kind of moldy-looking right, right. black stuff on them. Okay, you got so many different symptoms. My eyes just crossed. I, I mean, and here's a couple of things. For, for one thing, you've got a resource here on the Gulf Coast, a guy named Gary Bachman, Dr. Gary Bachman. He's an extension consumer horticulture of the state. He lives in Biloxi. Well, or, or, or he, he, he might live over in, uh, you know, in the, uh, okay. across the bay. I can't remember the name of the little town, a cute little town across in the... Cap- Ocean yeah, ocean springs. But anyway, he is a he is a a, a a citrus expert, and he works there in Biloxi. So have him swing by sometime and, and take a look at it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to just make a real general guess and uh, about what you can do. I don't know what the problem is because you describe too many different things. I know that mm-hmm. if a plant is having trouble with diseases or poor growth or spindly uh, or, or whatever, pruning will stimulate new growth. It's called rejuvenation. You know, cutting a plant that's struggling way back rejuvenates it with all new growth, and it balances the top with the roots. See, so it, it, without knowing anything at all else about it, I would prune at least some of it back pretty hard to stimulate some strong, healthy new growth. And now that's just okay. that's just a pure horticultural shotgun approach, but it usually works. Can I do that now, or do I have to wait? It's, until it's not the best time because you know plants don't put on new growth until spring, and if you cut it now, it's just going to sit there all winter, and it's going it to just it's not going to be happy, not going to look good. You know, you might want to neaten it up a little bit, but I would do some that kind of hard pruning sometime in the the late winter of the spring, closer to when new growth is going to come out. And again, this is this is nothing but a uh, this is old uh, a dock out of gun smoke, or, you know, shooting. Shotgun talk, <laughs> but a lot of times that works. You know, if when in doubt, cut it back. Okay, doctor, but but, but uh, do, do get do get Gary Bachman to come by because I mean that's 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 his job. Okay, and he's with the extension. That's right. That's right. Now, I think it's there on Pops Ferry Road. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. All righty. Thanks for your call. You know, sometimes you just gotta, you know, Doc. What was Doc's name in Gunsmoke? His last name, Doc. It was just Doc, right? That's as far as I know, and I've seen seemingly every episode of that. Yeah. I worked at a local television station that ran that on Sunday night, so yeah. I've seen entirely more gun smoke than I probably should have, and I still can't remember. Yeah, well, anyway, Doc, he he knew a whole lot, but we got to remember that was the 1880s. You right. know, they didn't have MRIs at the time. They didn't. <laughs> so I did come across a uh, another Frankenstein quote here. He said, I admired virtue and good feelings and loved the gentle manners and amiable qualities of my cottagers. I thought I was shut away from intercourse with them except through means which I obtained by stealth when I was seen, unseen and unknown, which rather increased than satisfied the desire I have of becoming one of my fellows. This is too, this is too, it's too much. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm a, mm. Look, look, I'm going to turn, I'm turning this off there. No, no more Frankenstein Why? Quote. Why? Why? Because it's, it's introspective, man. It's yeah, deep. But, but last week, Jay, we were talking about the difference between corn dogs and pronto pups. Well, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's also a. Think radio, right? Right. <laughs> well, anyway, horticulturist fell a rushing. And I uh, forgot to mention, I'm going to, I went yesterday, um, the last Garden Club talk of the season, I went and I talked to the, to the Brook. Garden Club in Jackson. L- 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 neighbors, these ladies know me. I could, I, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't extemporize too much because they all know where I live. Uh, but also, I went to the Flora Plant Swap. And, uh, Jay, the oldest is, one, right? The oldest in the known universe, and, and as far as I know. And you know, and I hate to say this, but I wrote the book. Okay, so there might be one in parts unknown that could well, be older. I, we been, just don't know. I participated in the oldest one in England. Uh, it's in Sheffield, England, and uh, and it's an old one. But this one goes back to the to 1990. 
started by a woman named Janice Watson, who was a librarian in Florida. But anyway, and I was at it. They have pictures of me. I was skinny. I got short hair. I got big old, you know, it, I, I, I was an extension of work for the university. They had to be respectable looking. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's a it's an opportunity, Jay. You, you know, you see people who who go to let's say the Saints games. You watch these fans of professional. They got on the funny hats. Yeah. They got on the clothes. They got on the grease paint. All the weird stuff. And they're fanatical. And, yeah. It, 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 when they get together, you look at them and you know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Right. You know, sort of like on on Halloween night. You know, see all these crazy costumes going up and down the street. It's okay because it's the right context. But if one of those Saints fans and all their regalia were to walk down your street late at night in, <laughs> let's say, August, you're going to call Neighborhood Watch. Yeah. Or if you see a, a, what looks like a zombie or a Frankenstein or a, or a princess or whatever, you can think they're uh, – because it's the wrong venue. Well, there's a lot of people like that. Uh, you know, you take all the people from the from the football games, and when they go home, they spread across the landscape. They go to their little towns and their neighborhoods, and they're separated. There may be just one in each neighborhood, but they're still like that inside. You mm-hmm. just can't tell. Yeah. Well, gardeners who are like that can't take off the grease paint. They can't stop. You know, they just have yards that look like like Halloween, or like my mother said, a kaleidoscope having a stroke. You know. <laughs> You know, but but and they so they can't hide, and they don't have a venue for getting together because they're stuck in their yards. And people talk about them like you would uh, a, a Saints fan at the coffee shop. Yeah. Well, plant swaps where people like that can get together. They're I think not, people are just jealous, Felder. I think people wish that they had the time or the motivation to be that that wild and or, charismatic in their yard with or, their yard or, 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 they want or, that relationship or just, feel free enough and i'll tell you how most people do it a maybe lot of i'm pe- speaking for myself I yeah know. you know a lot of people have, have living rooms you know and the only time you sit on the couch is when the preacher or insurance guy comes by but you go back in the back into the den and there's dirty socks on the coffee table and, and all like yeah, that yeah. that's the way these folks garden out in the front yard there you go you know they're comfortable they're relaxed and it's not that they're rebels or they're pushing back they're just feel like and they're not trying to make a statement they're just being themselves yeah well anyway those people typically are not joiners they don't they're not master gardeners they don't belong to the garden club they don't go to plant society so the only venue they have to get together where they feel safe is at plant swaps when they come together it's like night of the living dead you know, the plants, the people, and there's some elegant folks there, but a lot of people who don't come to town that much. And they will bring pots of precious heirlooms that they got from Aunt Mamie, who got it from Mama, who you know, all these pass along plants you can't buy any place. Yeah. They're valuable, they're easy to grow, they're easy to propagate. But the venue for those folks to get together are plant swaps because it's safe. You don't have to there's no dues. You don't have to vote or anything. Yeah. Uh, and then they can go home just like so I think of plant swaps like a a Halloween party, you know, with everybody come together and going away. There's going to be uh, all this leading up to it. one of the biggest ones in our region is going to be tomorrow in Mobile. Mobile has a plant swap every spring and every fall. And there will be oh, dozens and dozens and dozens of people bringing really unusual plants to swap, and it's free. It's going to be at Central Prez Church. There's a parking lot. they got a little community garden there. Uh, it's at the corner of Dolphin Street and I think uh, uh, Aunt South Ann Street. Anyway, it's easy to find. Central Prez Church. Uh, I've been to it many, many times. I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to drive, drive down and, and bring some plants. But if anybody is anywhere near Mobile, Alabama, tomorrow morning, it starts at 10 o'clock, real informal, real friendly, a lot of laughter, a lot of really, really cool plants. Bring something if you got it. If not, there will be plenty to share. But Central Press Church parking lot, Mobile, Alabama, they have a really, really nice plant swap. Looking forward to seeing some folks there, too. How was the one last week that you went to? Yeah, it was it was fine. It was fine. You know, like I told uh, you know, I, I I told the folks that uh Well you hit it. North Ann Street and Dolphin Street. Yeah, how about that? Well, yeah. I mean I've been there a whole bunch, you know, and, uh, and, it's, and it's right off of, of, of Governance Street. Not it's not hard to find. But uh anyway, I hope to see some folks there. Again, that's Saturday. It starts at ten o'clock. Come early because there's a lot of camaraderie and people, you know, eyeing each other, look at their plants and they set them in rows on the on the parking lot and then you, you pull numbers and whatever number you get, you go get that plant and then people swap after it. Then nobody leaves without a a trunk load of stuff. Anyway, oh, that just sounds wanna, pretty good. Yeah. Trunk load of stuff. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>
So anyway, I think that we've got Alan on the line from Pearl. Is that right? Yes, sir. Good morning. What's up, man? Um, I've got an older crate myrtle. It's huge, and we've had it for years. <laughs> and just for the last several years, um, I know you're familiar with this problem. Every year, it does fine up to about mid-summer. And then, you know, it starts getting these spots on the leaves, and they turn yellow. And then it winds up uh, everything. All the leaves start falling off, and I don't think it's insect-related. No, it doesn't sound like it to me. Um, and you know. I've, talk, I've talked to the uh, horticulturist here in Rankin County. She suggested taking Do- some samples and sending to the state to that, find out exactly what it is. That'd be Donna Bielik. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, sir. And um, but is there any like systemic drench that I could start pouring around this in like the spring to maybe help ward this off? Well, let, let's let's back up just a bit, and and I'm I'm putting my thinking cap on. But keep in mind, I helped teach the tree surgery course at Mississippi State, and I I mean I've been yes. the arboriculture, not just tree surgery, you know, tree care, how they grow, and all this kind of stuff. If right. the if the leaves are are showing color and shedding, that's usually not a disease. A lot of, if there's some leaf spots on it, you know, there are fungal diseases that can that can can defoliate a plant, just like with roses and their black spot. And there are some of those that that will knock the leaves off a tree. Um, right. But but there's not any way to prov- to to keep that from happening every year because the fungus are floating around just like ragweed pollen. Uh, right. And the only control for that, if that's if that's what the problem is, if it's, if they're falling off because of a fungal disease, you have to apply a fungicide, which doesn't right. it doesn't cure a disease. People don't realize, you know, you got an insect, you can squirt it, it'll die. But uh, fungal right. disease, the fungicides are, are are like sunscreen. You put sunscreen on before you get sunburned, not after you right. get sunburned. So the only right. only way to control leaf spots on plants is to apply fungicides ahead of time. You know, right. sort of like a gamble based on past history. But get this, they only last for a couple of weeks or a couple of rains before oh, they, they wear a wash off. And and if you got new leaves, they're not protected. See, so you have to use fungicides, you know, every two or three weeks or so. Right. Which is not easy on a big crepe myrtle tree. And I've heard that it can be bad for the bees, and I have. No, the fun, and, fun, fungicides, not, fungicides are not. You know, that, that's not a problem. Oh, okay. you, know, you know, they're not. Oh, okay. The stuff we put in the soil, the, the systemic insecticide, is to keep insects. When insects bite a tree, then the tree oh, okay. has got poison sap, and it kills them that way. You know, that's what we're doing with the crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, but anyway, if it's, a, if it's a fungal disease, you have to spray ahead of time regularly and that's not easy okay. it's not cheap it's not fun second thing is it might just be that the tree is under stress because in general if a tree drops its leaves if they turn brown or, or colors and they shed that tree is under stress if they turn brown right. and stick if they stick on that part of the tree is dead so it sounds like your tree could could also just be under stress and sometimes right. the best way to deal with that would be just a little fertilizer in the spring and on occasion, oh, okay. you know, maybe one good soaking a month, you know, to keep the tree healthy. And that, if that's all it is, if the tree's got, doesn't have a really good root system, really, really big, puts on a lot of growth in the spring when growing is easy, turns hot and dry right. and miserable, tree says, you know what, I can't do this, and it starts throwing leaves off. So a little fertilizer, yeah. a little, uh, a, an occasional good deep soaking. And, and other than that, that's about all we can do. What um, as far as fertilize? What would you? What what numbers would you like? Uh, you, you have triple? any? You have any grass nearby? Yes, sir. Just fertilize your grass sometime in April. That's more than enough for the tree too. And if you're not fertilizing oh. your grass, you ought to every three or four or five years. Right. So sometime okay. in, in April, just fertilize your grass. You know, go to the garden center, get the stuff they sell for for centipede food. You know, centipede right. food has got it's got a good common. You know, not agriculture, not triple thirteen, and all that stuff because ammonium nitrate is not really good in the garden. But you know, a good quality centipede type food uh, oh, in okay. in April, and that's enough for your trees and your shrubs too if you get it under them. Oh, okay.
Okay, well, that's that's good. I appreciate that, and um, I still may send some leaves off just to you know see what we can come up with. Well, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to diagnose a disease unless it's fresh. You know, this time of year the leaves are all shriveling up anyway and all like that. So oh, what yeah. what you do is when you first start seeing it in the summertime, send some of those leaves and the new leaves. That may be because they look for active fungi on the leaves. Right now, they're all dried right. up. They can't tell much. Yeah, that's what Miss Donna was recommending. That as soon as it starts, put them in a ziplock and send them off. And yeah, and yeah, yeah. All well, right. Well, I sure appreciate it. Good luck on it, man. Yes, sir. Thank y'all. All right, a caller from from Pearl, Mississippi. Now let's go to Summit. Is it PC calling from Summit? Hey, Phil, how you doing? Fine, fine. What's going on? Oh, uh, yes, I just have a question about a plum tree. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife and I have two plum trees. It's about, probably about 15, 20 plus years old. But uh, I've never pruned the trees before. And like now, I've noticed this was the first year that it didn't uh, make any plums. But the uh, limbs were so long, you know, I barely can't even weed eat on the, to the, underneath, close to the trunk. Yeah. And, uh, but... Ants have made a home right at the trunks over the years, and I just let it go and let it go. Did that hurt I was anything? Just trying to figure out, I was just trying to figure out how to, uh, best way to get rid of the ants because it's rotting the trunks at the bottom from the ants. You know, I guess they're sucking up, eating up the, the uh, supply oh, too. Yeah. Well, but, okay. Uh, let's take a I'm thing. Going, let's take a thing. First of all, the ants aren't hurting the tree. They're not hurting the tree. Are these the little great big old black carpenter ants or just regular ants? Your regular fire yeah, ants. Yeah, they're they're just nesting there. They're not they don't hurt. Th- they're not like termites. The ant, ants aren't. You know, they're just taking advantage of a nice little cave they found to live in. See, so you know, you you can just mess with them. You can throw some hot water on them, any kind of insecticide, anything to make them move along. But they're not really hurting the tree. They're they're really really not. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, okay. I, I'm just real familiar with that. Um, and a matter of fact, I have two fire ant mounds in my garden, one in the side yard in my compost and one in the front yard. And I leave them alone because as long as you know where that mound is, they'll keep other mounds from popping up anywhere else. And they are actually sort of beneficial. They eat bad bugs and stuff. Anyway, ants aren't a problem. As far as the tree, though, if you don't, if you haven't been pruning it from the first year you set it out, then it really doesn't do any good to cut it way, way back now. You're going to lose some fruit. So what I would do is I would go at this winter, when you can see what you're doing, and not going to be yellow jackets out there, uh, go ahead and take you a, a, a saw and cut off some of the clutter. And maybe you got three or four limbs close to each other, cut one of them off. And then when you get through thinning out the big stuff, just, just here and there, and no two people do it the same, so don't worry about that, then whatever's left, thin some of the branches off the big limbs that are left. And then when you're done with that, whatever is getting in your way of mowing your yard, just cut that off. Think plucking eyebrows. You got an eyebrow growing off the side of your face, just pluck it out. Leave what you want, cut off what's bothered you. Yeah, and so, okay, th- th- yeah, thin out some of the big stuff, then thin out some of the middle stuff on what's left, and then the stuff that's in your way, just cut it back. Do I uh, do I thin it out like this time of the year when it's going to get cold, and just wait till? Oh, uh, I'd, next I'd, I'd wait till middle of the winter. Middle of the winter, first of all, you know, you, you, is it going to be a day when you're just knocking around without much to do? That's the time to do it. You know, it might be a little cold, but you can see better what you're doing. You know, when didn't have right, any leaves correct. left on it. And as long as you leave some of it unpruned, then it will bloom and have some plums next year. So don't booger the whole thing up. Don't turn it into a hat rack. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, Fred, I sure appreciate it, sir. And uh, I enjoy the show. And uh, just let you know that I became a su- su- subscriber about three weeks ago. So I just, uh, all, I, I, all I do is listen to MPB. It's pretty much everywhere I go. <laughs> well, I, 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 pre, I appreciate that. You know, it's a, it's a inter, there's a lot of interesting stuff. You know, Jay does a, a program during the week, and he uh, I, is the tech one. Is that the one you do, Jay? Is it the tech thing? That's it. I mean, because I'm not a tech guy, I'm, and, I, and I don't even have the I don't even know the right questions to ask. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, appreciate your call, man. Yes, sir. And keep up the Frankenstein. Throughout the uh, show, <laughs> <laughs> I might be. Well, actually, I already deleted that thing because I, I, I was starting to get too heavy there. So, you know, go, go online and Google uh, Frank, Frankenstein's best quotes. 
And there's like 50 sites with some of the Frankenstein's weird, weird quote. People just don't think about the monster being smart. And he was. He was just, he just all boogered up. That's all. Anyway, appreciate it, man. Now let's slide up. Uh, hey, all of a sudden we've just, it's like a calls have come pouring in here. Let's slide up to North Mississippi. See what Kay's up to. Kay, how far north are you? Boonville. Yeah. About 20 miles, I guess, from the Tennessee Mississippi line. The ice box. Well, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, what 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 you got going on this morning? Well, have you opened any persimmon seeds yet? You know, I have not. I have not. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I read a reference to it the other day, and I meant to, and I know where a pers- and I will do that when I, li- I, I I walk in every morning, and I walk past a persimmon tree, and, and if the possums hadn't got them all, so have you opened them what one up? I have, and it looks like a spoon. Okay, Jay, it's do you know what she's talking about? not a fork. Jay, do you know what she's talking about? I don't. <laughs> Persimmons have got a single seed in there. It's a big flat seed, sort of like a great big watermelon seed. And if you hold it with some pliers and split it straight down, you know, like you're going to look at the heart of it, the embryo in, the embryo in it is going to be shaped like a, like a knife or a fork or a spoon. And that's supposed to predict the winter. What? And Kay, you're saying you see a spoon, which should mean shoveling snow. Yep. And you know the old farmer's almanac says that it's seventy five percent accurate. So we'll see. Oh, <laughs> we'll see. I'll, I'll look at some too. But you know, and, and what did you use to cut your roof? Because you know you can hurt yourself trying to cut one of those things open. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's very. It's, it's you have to be very careful. But I I opened a seed that was fresh from the fruit, mm-hmm. and I used a knife, but. Then I got some wire pliers to hold it. There you go. That's what I and do. finally, I just whittled it down to where I could kind of stick the knife <laughs> in there and prize it open. <laughs> and it just, you know, it just separated itself in there. There's a spoon. Uh, evidence was. Okay. In North Mississippi, yeah. the persimmons are predicting shoveling snow. Right. Okay. And I, I, I have another question about a persimmon. How, how do you tell a boy tree from a girl tree? I've got some big persimmon trees and only one which is a little old scraggly thing it's the the trunk is probably maybe two inches in diameter and that's the only one that bears fruit oh, we don't say scrap we say she's a scrappy thing well okay that, that, well she's it, scrappy then but she has <laughs> she has about this year she had 19 uh persimmons on her of course the squirrels and possums probably got some of them but yeah. Uh, we've got a four or five that we could eat. Well, to, to answer your question, you can't, you know, our native persimmon, you know, Japanese persimmons, the orientals, it look like, I mean, they're big as tennis balls, and they're orange. They're beautiful plants. They're incredible landscape plants. And uh, some of them are self-fertile, so you only need one. And and I see a lot of those in landscape. It's a great landscape plant, even if you don't like to eat persimmons. But our native ones come up as either male or female, and they go through a juvenile phase, just like people. So you really can't tell whether male or female until they start flowering, which might be six, seven, eight years old. And uh, yeah. you, when they flower, you can look at the flower, and the female flowers are on the end of a tiny, tiny little bump, which would become the persimmon. And the males have just got the little frilly things with the pollen on them. So unless you look at the flowers, you can't tell them apart till they, till they fruit. Well, I guess I'll just have to make two with the what did you say, scraggly? Stra- uh, scra- uh, scrappy. Scra- 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 yeah, scrappy. Scraggly. Scrappy. No, yeah, scrappy. but she's she's scrappy. a sc- she she's little, but she's scrappy. She's a fighter. Well, that's, that's, for- <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. Okay. Well, thanks for the information on I, I, whether it's a boy or a girl. <laughs> well, and thanks for we'll, we'll we'll see if your persimmon is right, at least in North Mississippi, about snow this this winter. Okie dokie. <laughs> Appreciate thanks it. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> I like that way better than peeling a groundhog out of the out of the ground. Yeah. And holding yeah. him up uncomfortably yeah. in front of everybody. See, see, you didn't know you, you didn't know the persimmons come in separate male and female. I didn't. And you can split the seed open and predict the winter. There's a lot of weird stuff out there about gardening. You All know, right, so the, the the spoon is shoveling snow. What's the fork? The fork is uh is I want to say is 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 light. Uh, I forget what the fork means, but knife means cutting cold. 
Okay. I forget what the fort means. We, we'll, we'll know about that next week. <laughs> I'm going to go do that myself. Something about eating salads late in the spring or something like that. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you wait till the, <laughs> till the corn is the si- the, till the, till the, till the pecan leaves are the size of a squirrel's ear. That's when you fertilize your grain. <laughs> There's a lot of that out there. But that's yeah. what makes it so fun, though. Yeah, a lot, a lot of folk stuff. And that's the thing about, you know, gardening versus horticulture. Jay, you know, I'm trained as a horticulturist. I'm a horticulture science, got the degrees and retired professor and all that kind of stuff. But gardening, horticulture is about, process, about product. You know, you're doing things to achieve a goal. Yard of the month, fill the freezer, you know, cut flowers. Uh, if there's a goal involved, you know, uh, 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 an end result, a, a destination, Horticulture has all these little rules and stuff about how to do it, when to prune, when to fertilize, all that kind of stuff. But that's assuming you're goal-oriented. And I'll give you an example. If you want to win a blue ribbon at the flower shop, my great-grandmother taught me this. She was a horticulturist, garden club lady from the 1930s. She said, if you want to get a blue ribbon at a flower show, it's not what you know that counts. It's not what you do that counts. It's how you figure out ahead of time what the judges are looking for. Yeah. You got to jump through some hoops that not what you want to do, but what do they expect of you? Anyway, that's horticulture, gold product oriented. Gardening is is process. It's the it's the journey. You know, I plant tomatoes every year and I, I never grow tomatoes, Jay. I'm not a good gardener. <laughs> I'm and I'm a garden expert, you know. I figure a brain surgeon doesn't have a tu- doesn't need a tumor, you know. I don't I don't do the stuff it takes to have a nice garden. I just plant stuff. And knowing that tomatoes aren't going to make for me, I plant them anyway because it gives me hope. But knowing they may not get ripe, or if they do, the birds are going to get them, the squirrels could get them. What I do is I take a Sharpie pen out in my yard, and I draw smiley faces on the green ones. <laughs> and if that's all I got, I win. That's I, it. I win because it's the process. It's the journey. Yeah. Or, or as as we Stoics say, the glass is neither half empty nor half full. It's a marvelous vessel. I like that. Yeah. We've got a real philosophical day from Frankenstein to... I know. Uh, I, need, I need to go out. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out the door. I'm going to grab my stuff. I'm going to walk my, my little colorful sumac stuff. I'm going to walk straight to a persimmon tree. I'm going to cut it open, and I'm going to see whether she's right. Up in North Mississippi. All right. Persimmons. Now, will, will, will they change their mind from North Mississippi down to Central Mississippi and then di- a, a different story in South Mississippi? Uh, well, you know, uh, you know, this is the process we're on. You know, this is the journey. <laughs> I'm asking we, too many questions. We, 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 will, we will, looking back, we'll know. Right. Meanwhile, folks, Jay, I appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. Always a lot of fun. Job. And, uh, folks, we're going to be talking about gardening every Friday. Read Broad Council on Saturdays. Hope to see some of y'all at the Mobile Plant Swap. Starts at 10 o'clock. Get there early at the Central Presbyterian Church. Just Google it. It's easy to find. Look forward to seeing some of y'all there. Meanwhile, if you get a chance, farmers markets are wide open. They're ripping and roaring. Garden centers are loaded with cold weather plants. Take a kid or a neighbor or a friend to a garden center and uh, together, collectively, let's do what we all do best and that's get dirty. See y'all next week. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android.